Are you new to opera and you think it's all boring, high-pitched wobbling that only rich old people listen to? You'd be right. <laughs> I'm joking. So, opera. It was the Netflix of its day and its themes continue to be universal. These are stories that we can still connect with now. If you don't know where to start with opera, it can be pretty intimidating to just jump in. So you may think, oh, I don't speak Italian or German or whatever, and that might detract from your experience. But in reality, a lot of the language used is really old, and it sounds kind of weird to the people who speak those languages today anyway. It's a bit like going to a Shakespeare play as an English speaker. So you understand the words, but it's a bit of an adjustment to understand what's actually being said. And this is one of the reasons why there have been so many movie adaptations of Shakespeare plays that use colloquial language and they modernize things whilst using the same themes. Because these stories are timeless. Opera? Totally the same. And actually part of my own process when I'm preparing a role is that I will do the translation into my native language and then I'll also write a colloquial translation. So something that I can like connect with instantly. And when I'm teaching students, Sometimes I'll ask them like, okay, but what do you really mean here? Like, how would you say this in your own words? And then all of a sudden it becomes so much more personal and impactful and you can connect with this timeless story and all the emotion that goes with it. So today I want to tell you the story of La Boheme or the Bohemians by Puccini, which is an opera that I often recommend to opera newbies. So warning, there will be spoilers, a lot of spoilers. Everything will be spoiled. <laughs> if you want this turn into a series, let me know which opera you'd like me to do next in the comments. So grab your beverage and let's get into it. So, Paris, 1830. Or, depending on the production you watch, it might even be set in modern times or even on the moon. So we have two dudes in the apartment. It's in the middle of winter and they've burnt half of their furniture to try and keep warm. So their names are Rodolfo, who's a writer, and Marcello, who's a painter. So Marcello says, mate, it's still really cold and there's nothing left for us to burn. And Rodolfo goes like, hey, that's no problem. Let's just burn the manuscript of this drama I've been working on. Now, keep in mind, it is a paper manuscript. You can't even save it to like Dropbox for later or anything like that. So in comes another roommate called Colina, who's a philosopher. And he's all meow, 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 because he wasn't able to pawn some of his books, so he's also broke. Then comes in the fourth friend, Shonad, and he's a musician. And he's like, guys, check it out. And he has all of this awesome food and wine. And obviously these guys haven't been able to afford stuff like this in ages. So how did Shonad get all of this stuff, you may ask? Has Shonad turned to a life of crime? Well, actually, it turns out he was employed by this weird old English guy and he wanted him to play violin to his parrot until it died. Which I guess is kind of sweet, uh, you know, making his little parrot life more comfortable as he crosses into little parrot heaven. Anyway, this must have taken a while because Shanard got paid, like, a lot <laughs> for this job. So he's like, guys, it's Christmas Eve, like, let's save this food for later, let's go out and celebrate. So they're like, oh, great idea. Let's go hit up our local. Their local being Cafe Momus. So they're already leave. And then there's this knock at the door. And it's the landlord. So maybe he could hear them being all rowdy. And he's like, I know that noise. That's payday noise. So the landlord is like, guys, you haven't paid rent in ages. Like you need to pay up or I'm going to kick you all out. Now it is payday for the guys, but they're thinking, no, this is our part. Party money is not our adulting money. <laughs> so they invite the landlord in, they give him some wine, loosen him up a bit, and then they start building him up. And the landlord, he loves this. Like he's lapping it up. He's like, yeah, no, I'm pretty, I'm pretty cool, hey. So this continues, the landlord gets drunker and drunker, and he starts talking about how popular he is with the ladies. So then the guys are like, wait, aren't you married? And the landlord's like, well, yeah. Huh. So the guys, they pretend they are morally outraged by this and they're like, you're an get out of our house, you're So they throw the landlord out and then the guys are like, woo, he's gone, let's go party. 
So then Rodolfo, the writer, is like, hold up, guys. I just have, like, a little bit more left to write. But, you know, you go on ahead. I'll be there in a minute. You know, Rodolfo probably wants to finish his work so he can, like, burn it later. So finally, he has some peace and quiet. He goes over to his desk. He sits down, ready to concentrate. And... Ah! <laughs> like, what is it now? So he goes up, opens the door, opens it, and... Oh, my God this really hot girl. So it turns out that this is his neighbor and her candle has gone out. So keep in mind, this is the days before electricity. So if you don't have a candle, you can't see it. And it's also super, super cold. So she asks for a light and he's like, yeah, sure, come on in. So then awkwardly, she has like this coughing fit and collapses. Can you imagine, especially in these days with like Corona and you like see this hot guy and you're like, oh, Hi. And then you just have like this coughing fit all over his stuff, like, oh, sweetheart. <laughs> anyway, Rodolfo, he's just standing there like, uh, this girl just passed out in my apartment. What do I do? So he props her up and gives her some wine because, you know, wine is definitely the thing that's going to help in this situation. <laughs> so she wakes up. She's a bit embarrassed at this point. So Rodolfo, he lights her candle and she goes to leave. But as she's leaving, she feels around in her pockets and she's like, you know what? I've lost my key. It must have fallen out of my pocket when I fainted. So as she's coming back in, there's a draft of wind and her candle goes out again. Now, perhaps the draft also blew out Rodolfo's candle or maybe he was like, oh no. Oh, my candle has gone out too. So now they're looking for the key together in the dark. So they're both looking around on their hands and knees for this stupid key. And at this point you can cut the sexual tension with a knife. And Rodolfo, he actually finds the key and puts it into his pocket. And he's like, key? What key? Because you know, he wants to spend a little bit more time with her in the dark. So they're looking around, they're getting closer and closer and they accidentally touch hands. Now Rodolfo, he thinks, okay, perfect time to make my move. So he's like, oh my God, your hand is so cold. Like, let me warm it in my hand. I mean, it's pretty smooth, I guess. <laughs> so he starts singing his famous aria, Que Gelida Manina, which is literally, what a cold hand. Que Manina, se la introduces himself he says that he's a writer and he doesn't make much money but for what he lacks in financial wealth he makes up in emotional wealth yes Rodolfo I tell myself the same thing <laughs> and finally he lets his neighbor speak <laughs> so she sings her aria si mi chiamano mimi or yes they call me mimi which she then follows up directly with but my name is Lucia wait what like who are these people? Like, why are they calling me Mimi when that's not your real name? And I mean, this is something that is glossed over for the rest of the opera. It's never mentioned again. And all of the other characters call her Mimi from then on. So some people interpret this as maybe that Mimi is a sex worker and that's why she has another name. But really, we don't know. Anyway, she goes on to say that she makes artificial flowers for a living, that she's a pretty chilled person. She lives alone. Hmm. <laughs> and that even though necessarily she doesn't go to church, she still likes to pray. And then she kind of forgets where she is and she goes off into like this dreamlike state and she's imagining the sun on the first day of spring. why Mimi has this big out-of-body experience when she's talking about the first day of spring and feeling of warmth 
Keeping in mind that it is the middle of winter and she's having these coughing fits which are making her pass out, so maybe there's a part of her wondering if she's going to experience the first sunshine of spring again. So she kind of snaps out of whatever thing she was experiencing and she's all embarrassed again for doing this like weird shit in front of a guy she likes. And Rodolfo is like, no, you aren't weird. The moon is hitting your face right now and you look amazing. And I'm like, oh my God. My emotions. And then she's like, oh. My emotions. And then they sing together like, ah. Rodolfo decides to shoot his shot and he's like Baby, it's cold outside Why don't we just stay here in my shitty apartment and keep warm together, hmm? And she's like, mm, are your friends like expecting you outside? But hey, you know what? Why don't I come with you? Jeez, Rodolfo, like at least buy the girl dinner first So they decide to go but then Rodolfo decides to shoot his shot again and says Tell me you love me Okay, like, is that a bit of a red flag? Like, just me? Okay. Anyway, whatever her feelings on that just happening, she does say, I love you, and they have a bit of a patch. Two, we are in the Latin Quarter of Paris and there's a bunch of markets and stuff, so it's Christmas Eve. Everyone's out having a great time, they're buying presents, there's like cute little kids singing. Rodolfo and Mimi, they're checking everything out, they're like, oh my god, fun. And then he buys her this like cute little like bonnet hat thing. So they meet up with the other three friends from before. And the friends, they've also splurged out and they've bought some stuff on Christmas Eve because you know. Three words for you. Treat. Yo. Sell. And now Kalina. The philosopher friend, he buys himself a nice warm coat. Now store that nugget away in your head because it does become important later. The friends, they all meet up at Cafe Mamus as planned and prepare to have a nice night together. But it's an opera. So it's not just a relaxed night out. No. So Maricello, remember Maricello, painter friend, he's like, is that my ex, Mosetta, over there? And so Mosetta, she is gorgeous and not only is she on a date with another guy but it seems she has found herself a sugar daddy but she's already kind of bored of this old guy and she's acting up so when she sees her ex Marcello at the other table she's thinking oh yeah it's on i am gonna make him so 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 jealous so she's making sure that every guy in the cafe is on her as she sings her aria quando men vo or when i go and she's saying here when I go down the street, men are just staring at me because I am so hot. And you know what? I love it, even if it drives you absolutely crazy. She then tries to get rid of her sugar daddy by saying her shoe is hurting her foot and he has to go and get it fixed for her. And this plan works because at the end, Marcello and Musetta, they also have a bit of a pash. And it looks as though that even though it's a pretty wild relationship, that they do actually really love each other. Also, like during this scene, Rodolfo says to Mimi, hey, if you ever acted like her, I wouldn't ever forgive you. Mimi is literally just like sitting there minding her own business and he's known her for like half an hour. Red flag. 
Okay, all of this craziness, it's interrupted by the bill arriving. But Mr. Moneybags, parrot violinist Shonard, realizes that his wallet is missing and none of the friends obviously have enough cash to pay. So at this point, Musetta, she's joined the group of friends and she's like, hey, no worries, just charge to my sugar daddy's account. And then they all leave. <laughs> when we get to act three, actually a bit of time has gone by. So the score says late February, so it's been two months since Christmas. And wow. Did it all go downhill in those two months? So it's still super cold. Mimi, she's staggering around in the snow. She's coughing her guts up. Now, red flag Rodolfo has picked a massive fight with her the night before, saying like, oh, you flirt with guys all the time. And he's stormed out of the apartment. So Mimi, she's trying to find his best friend, the painter Marcello, to talk to him and see what the hell is going on. So she finds him, he's painting like a mural thing at this bar and she's like, dude, I have no idea what is going on with Rodolfo. Like he's just jealous as hell. I have no idea what to do. And Marcello's like, yeah, he is acting pretty weird, but you know what? He's inside the bar, I can go talk to him. Anyway, around this time, Rodolfo, he comes out of the bar and Mimi is like, you know what? I just can't deal with this guy right now. So she goes and hides and listens into their conversation. Like, girl, nothing good can come of this. Like, just go home, have some soup or something. So Maricello asks Rodolfo, he's like, dude, what is going on with you and Mimi? And he launches into this whole tirade of like, oh man, she's such a s she's always flirting with other guys. I'm just like so sick of it. Marcello is like, are we talking about the same girl here? Cause like Mimi is not like that at all. And then Rodolfo finally cracks and he's like, yeah, okay. She's not like that at all. You're right. But have you noticed she's coughing a lot lately? I mean, there's nothing I can do to help that. Like I'm broke. You know, I can't send her to a doctor or anything. So I'm hoping that if I treat her like she'll just leave and she'll find someone else who can look after her. Red flag, Rodolfo. I mean, what a guy. <laughs> so Marcello knows that Mimi is like right there listening in and he's like trying to get Rodolfo like, shut up. But Mimi, she obviously hears everything and she comes out of hiding and she's like, fine. You know what? Let's break up, but no hard feelings. <laughs> So if there wasn't enough going on right now, Marcello can hear that his girlfriend Musetta, remember her, sexy Musetta, she's laughing with a bunch of guys inside the bar and he's like, like, not this again. So he goes inside to investigate. So Mimi and Rodolfo, they're breaking up, but it's one of those breakups where you say you're breaking up, but then you're like, no, I love you. And then like you get back together again, you know, that type of breakup. So they figure, hey, it's still really cold. Let's break up in spring when it's warmer and it'll be less sad that way. Yeah. Anyway, around this time, Marcello has confronted Musetta and they have a massive fight about what has just happened inside. So you have four people singing at the same time. So two of them are fighting and the other two are reconciling and getting back together. <laughs> Then we move on to act four, final act. More time has passed and Marcello and Rodolfo, they're trying to do their work, but they can't really concentrate because both Mimi and Musetta have left them. So they're all Devo. So apparently both the girlfriends have now found new boyfriends and both of the new boyfriends have money. So Marcello and Rodolfo are feeling like pretty like meow meow about this. So the other two friends from before, parrot violinist Shonard and the philosopher Colline, they come in with like some basic food for dinner and they read the room and they realize that their friends are feeling pretty down. 
So they like try and make them feel better, you know, they start cracking jokes and they pretend that this like basic meal that they brought is like this big fancy banquet and they're all fancy. But then there's a knock at the door and the mood turns around really fast because Musetta has found Mimi half dead in the street. She brings her to the front so they can figure out where to go from here. Now Mimi, she was out in the street because I guess she figured she was dying and she wanted to see Rodolfo again instead of her rich boyfriend, so she's legged it. Anyway, she kind of comes to when she realizes she's with Rodolfo and they have some really sweet moments together. And meanwhile, the other friends are like, this looks really bad. Like, what do we do? So Musetta and Marcello, they go together and they sell Musetta's earrings so they can bring her back some medicine. You know, remember back in act two when Kalina the philosopher bought that coat at the Christmas markets? So this guy, he's not even like a main character and this coat is basically the only thing he has in the world. But he decides to pawn the coat to try and get some money to help Mimi. Anyway, that leaves Shonard, parrot violinist, and Kalina is like, mate, don't be an awkward third wheel, like just come with and let these guys have some privacy. Okay, so this is basically the point in the opera where I start crying all the way to the end. So it turned out that Rodolfo kept the cute little hat thing that he bought for Mimi and he gives it to her. She's really happy and she tells him that she's in love with him and will be forever. So they're reminiscing about how they first met and Rodolfo's like, hey, I have a confession to make. Like, you know when we were looking for your key? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found it right away, but I wanted to spend more time with you. And Mimi is like, yeah, I knew that all along. Ah! <laughs> then poor Mimi, she starts coughing her guts up again and passes out. So the friends, they come back with a muff, which is like this fluffy thing to keep your hands warm. And they give it to Mimi, it gives her some comfort and she falls asleep. But then Shonad, the parrot violinist, realizes she's not actually sleeping. Mimi has died. And one by one, each of the friends realize what's happened. And the last one in the room to understand what's happened is Rodolfo, which is probably the most heartbreaking thing. the end. So Puccini, he creates these very realistic human relationships that we connect with and maybe we can see people that we know or even ourselves in these characters. So when we see Mimi die, we really do grieve for her along with her friends. So along with the highly emotional music, it's no surprise that this is considered one of the saddest moments in opera and why audiences keep coming back to this story over and over and over again. In fact, La Boheme is ranked number four for the most performed operas worldwide. So what do you think? Have you seen La Boheme before? If you have a favorite production or recording of La Boheme, let me know in the comments below. And if you like this video, make sure you give it a like and let me know which opera story you'd like to hear next. Thanks for hanging out with me and I will see you next time. Bye.